All right, guys, so if you have a glass of water that you've gotten from a local creek or lake, maybe it's from a stagnant pond or something like that around your house, there are slight risks. However, you can actually observe your jar closely and you can smell it. If it has a smell that is kind of pungent, like um, sewer, sewery or gross, and uh, if you can see things like dragonfly larvae or nymph in there, uh, mosquito larvae, things that are going to fly and that are going to come up out of your tank and be an issue, then you know that you need to at least get rid of those or give them time to hatch before adding them to your tank. Now, the other major problematic thing that's harder to see because it's microscopic, basically, is tapeworms and nematodes that can continue their life cycle and then end up growing to up to 30 feet in the intestines of humans, all sorts of mammals, and in the tissues of fish. So the way I like to test for that and to mitigate that when I've got my water nice and tannic with some leaves and some fresh plants, I want to get that surface area from ponds and so forth, is I will smell it, make sure that it doesn't smell off or anything. But then what I'll actually do is I'll just take a good old, good old uh, swig of it. And, uh, oh man, that's good. And in uh, two to four months, you will have tapeworms if uh, if your source has uh, tapeworms and nematodes in it. So it's a pretty good system, really. I mean... All right, guys, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here. So I want to talk about the idea of taking a jar full of water and going to your local lake or creek and literally just pouring that into your aquarium. Now, I have several thoughts on this. And the first is, if you're trying to experiment and set up a nature tank that is a biotope or a similar ecosystem to the water that you live near, then go right ahead. Do that from the start. Sure, have some fun, explore, see what happens. However, if you're trying to set up a tank for tropical fish, you know, angelfish, tetras, rasboras, danios, whatever it may be, and you're trying to give them the best ecosystem possible, you really need to think about where you live and the kind of creatures that would be in that water that are beneficial to your fish. So there's things like Daphnia, seed shrimp, uh, scuds or amphipods. I have a whole hour long video on them, raising them, collecting them, things like that, uh, if you're interested. But you really need to weigh whether it's worth going out and finding those things and trying to colony breed them and keep them as a live culture food that you can just add to your aquarium. Or if you want them to literally be part of the food web of your aquarium because if you want them to be part of an all-inclusive ecosystem you know you need to really think about are you living in a tropical location do you even have the kinds of creatures that will survive in tropical waters and with the plants you have and the substrate and the fact that it's not an entire ecosystem it is a replication of as much of that as we can get within a glass box um, and so these are important questions to ask yourself before you go out and do this. Now, I also think that there is some risk in doing this. However, let me taper that by saying that the risk of going out and grabbing something like a jar of, uh, of tannic water to jumpstart your black water tank so that you know you've got uh, bugs, as we'll call them, or little critters, that uh, are going to be part of your micro uh, organic ecosystem, it's not a bad idea to go to a local area with lots of leaves and tannins in the water and collect whatever it is that's living there. However, what I would do is make sure that you take that, you collect it, you have it in a jar or even another tank, and you bring it up to the temperature that your aquarium is going to be kept at. Now, Beyond this, I guess, live inoculations from uh, water that's coming from outside of your aquarium, it is prudent to 
have a probationary quarantine period. So I would suggest setting up a jar, even if it's a, a gallon mayonnaise jar or something, you know, and, and having it filled two thirds with water, a little bit of air, saran wrap over the top, poke a couple holes for uh, air exchange, or uh, you can even use a breather bag, put that over the top so that there's air exchange. Uh, but then bring it into your fish room and either set it into a uh, aquarium so that it stays at temperature or keep it in the room if the room is at temperature. Now, there's a couple reasons for doing this, and I'll explain the reasons and the risks as we go through each one of these here. So the reason first to do this is, do you know if these creatures can even survive at 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 Celsius? Uh, maybe you live somewhere like I do in Seattle where it's only that warm for part of the year, and for all we know, the part of the life cycle of those creatures is not even... Uh, alive and swimming and, and the part that a fish could eat or that that creature would be useful in breaking down components like leaves and things in our aquarium, maybe it goes into a dormant stage in summer. Maybe it's most active in the fall and spring, like many creatures are. Uh, so you kind of need to either know the creature that you're going for, which is tricky with microorganisms or near microorganisms, or you need to culture it on its own after you've established, yes, these little creatures that I found in this pond, they can survive at temperature in my aquarium or in my fish room. Well, the next question is going to be pH. So if you're taking it from black water or really tannic water full of uh, leaves and, uh, you know, that coffee color or Coca-Cola colored water, if you have water that is crystal clear or maybe even alkaline, you're keeping guppies, live bears, something like that in your water, and you go get something from a pond that's super acidic, there's a good chance whatever you grabbed is not even going to survive the pH shift. Now, there are plenty of creatures that can survive that shift as well, and some of those creatures are not the most, uh, they're not the most welcomed in our aquariums by most people. And, you know, we've got things like nematodes, leeches, uh, insect larvae like uh, dragonfly nymphs. Some of these things can actually do a lot of damage to your aquarium and to the creatures in your aquarium. A dragonfly nymph is a gnarly monster uh, for a little fish, especially if you're keeping nano fish. And while they are a food source for big fish out in nature and, and uh, the like, they can be a scourge that hunts down small fish, your fry, and then is also going to hatch out. The same is true for mosquitoes and other little uh, flying insects. They can hatch out. So this goes back to that probationary period that I suggest, which is you keep them in a jar, leave some air in the jar, you've got your ecosystem, whether that's some leaves, that's some detritus and mulm, uh, and you're trying to Wherever you're going to go get your sample from, whether it's a creek or a pond or river or lake, uh, you're going to want to try to match that pH, that flow, you know, with the aquarium you're trying to keep. So if you're trying to keep a hill stream tank and you've got a power head going all the time, then maybe go to a creek and look for creatures there. You can get things like caddisfly larvae and stuff like that. Now, I don't know why you'd want to add that other than it's interesting. Those are going to hatch out and fly away, and they're not really going to add a whole lot probably to your ecosystem other than being, you know, fascinating periwinkle uh, creatures that make this kind of complex shell around themselves. Anyways, so you can add those kind of things if that's interesting to you. However, it's not necessarily going to help or harm your aquarium, and I think that's where most of the creatures fall in what you would be collecting. Now, the important part that I think a lot of people assume is that, hey, I've got a brand new aquarium and I want the good bacteria from nature. Well, the good bacteria, sure, it's out in nature. It's everywhere. In fact, it will, it will establish in a tank even if you are not adding plants or anything to your aquarium. Over time, it, the spores are in the air. Uh, the bacteriums are in the air and on our hands and in tap water and everywhere else. And they will eventually colonize and you'll get your nitrosoma bacteria colonies and things like that. So 
you will eventually get that. It's only a matter of waiting a couple weeks. Now, the best way to jumpstart a tank bacteriologically and probably our archaea, which is another similar creature to bacteria, uh, as well as probably fungi and things like that, is by taking a tank that is four or five years old and is really healthy and lush and full of life and no issues with the fish health and taking some of that filter media. We all know that old trick. Well, I think that's still the best way to seed, you know, bacteria and your cycle in a tank. I think that's the best way to get diversity in an aquarium. And while there are dangers, things like tapeworms, leeches, flying insects, larvae that can eat fish even, that theoretically could end up in your water, uh, I've, I've seen that if you put a cover over it, you have it warm, especially if it's warm, the, their metabolisms are going to move quicker usually. They're going to hatch out, and you'll usually see them within a week, if not three or four days. You'll see their exoskeleton or, or their cocoon on the top of the water floating, and they'll be flying in the container. You can open it up, let them outside, or do whatever you want with them. But those are probably going to get eaten by the fish if you were to dump them directly in. However, some of those do carry other parasites within them that complete their life cycle within fish. So another thing to consider is, are you grabbing your, your uh, source of water that you want to uh, add all these microbes and bacteria and things to your aquarium? Are you adding it from a source that already has fish in it? Because those fish locally, they may be full of tapeworms. For instance, salmon around here have something like 90% of them have worms within their flesh. Now, as long as you cook it, it's fine, and humans just go about their business, and there's just these little stringy things in the meat every once in a while, uh, and everyone around here knows that who eats salmon. However, uh, you know, some of those things can do a lot of damage in a fish and really malnourish a fish, especially if it's a little tiny fish. So those creatures like tapeworms and nematodes that complete their life cycle sometimes by living in a little host creature or by free swimming and then being some sort of little seed or cyst or larva those there is a real possibility of bringing into your aquarium and maybe you don't want those in your aquarium and while over the years of doing this i have not seen major issues with that in fact i would 10 times rather use a random glass of lake water than I would go to the pet store and scoop up a glass of water out of any given tank and pour it in there. Now the reason for that too is fish density. So if you have a dense population of fish, like at a pet store in their systems, there's way more opportunities for vectors for parasites, the fish. And so things like the mulm at a fish store or in a bag of fish that have been shipped in water that came from a fish store, that water is so much more crucial to not add to your tank. Do not put that in your tank uh, for risk of putting some sort of parasite or pathogen in your tank. Now, some people are also considered with or concerned with things like Giardia and other bacteria that could be harmful to human health. So they say, I don't want to go, you know, get beaver fever, as they call it, or dysentery, uh, Oregon Trail style, and uh, end up sick because of something I put in my aquarium because I went to a stagnant body of water and brought that home, or brain eating amoebas. I mean, so there's these far fetched things that. Well, dysentery is not, but brain-eating amoebas are. And they're very unlikely, but there is that possibility. Now, I have an entire video, a live stream that was like an hour and a half long. I'll link it in the description or pin it in the comments about all the ways you can get sick from an aquarium. And those are possibilities. If you're straight up drinking your aquarium water, you don't wash your hands and you're touching your mouth and things, uh, so there are some precautions you should take with any aquarium. This is not talking about anything that's been inoculated from the wild. These things can just happen 
in our domestic home aquariums. So there is a risk that's always there. Every time you add a new fish or a plant, you're also introducing all sorts of bacteria and life forms. So I wouldn't count on wild bacteria and things so much uh, from your sample. What I would lean on these samples for is those little creatures that your baby fish are going to eat that are going to break down your leaves. Like I said, things like scuds, amphipods, things like uh, little snails, for instance, uh, things like little seed shrimp, ostracods as they're known, um, daphnia and cyclops. And unfortunately, tapeworms can live in cyclops and in small crustaceans. They can live in daphnia too, certain ones. And those little seeds or, or uh, rather eggs of things like a tapeworm, some of them can go from mammals or humans to fish to other things all over the place. And some of them can get 30 feet long in a human body. Now, this is unlikely from your fish tank, but my point is they can live inside a little cyclops or daphnia and then a fish eats them, they go into the tissue of the fish, then a bigger fish eats them, then they're gonna lay eggs because they're gonna grow up in the fish's body to the reproductive stage. And then that gets into your whole substrate and ecosystem and everybody's got worms. Uh, sounds like a book, doesn't it? Everybody's got worms. But the point being, that's not always the best. So if you're worried about that aspect of it, what I would recommend is that you use proziquantanil. Now that, that will get rid of most nematodes and worms, good ones included. There are plenty of good ones and detritus worms and things too, and you're gonna wipe them out. So I would treat your specimen container uh, or your samples of water you've combined, collecting from different parts of different ecosystems from you know, the top water, the bottom water, the mulm, the leaves, whatever it may be, I would put that, make that your quarantine container, treat that, that way you're not breaking down any existing uh, nematodes like detritus worms or, you know, anything that's just uh, not harmful, but it's just there. It's part of your little microflora and fauna and it's helpful in a lot of cases. So I think if you do this and you treat the jar is a quarantine period and zone, and you are thinking about what your end result is. Do you want a nature tank? Are you trying to feed your baby fry and things, extra food? Well, maybe then you establish a whole separate tank just to grow those creatures, scuds or daphnia or seed shrimp, uh, and then get those and add them gradually. And some will stray and probably uh, end up making home in your aquarium but over the long haul it's it's tricky to establish a real ecosystem from the ground up now it's totally doable i have whole videos on it and that's something you can do if you don't want to be feeding your aquariums you want them to be self-sustainable for the most part or near self-sustainable that is a worthy endeavor and i think a lot of people find satisfaction in that but that's probably not the end goal you will get by just tossing in a glass of water from your local pond. And does the risk outweigh the reward? For me, it's a little hard to say, uh, but I would say that you need to evaluate all these things for yourself and that I've talked to a lot of biologists, ichthyologists, friends and things, and most of them go out to ponds in their backyard which do not usually have fish, but which contain live cultures and things, uh, which contain tannins or leaves or various biological debris and microorganisms. And they'll scoop things out. They'll get seed shrimp, they'll get daphnia, they'll get mosquito larva, and they'll feed that right to their fish, even though there is that risk of tapeworms and things. They just don't see it as a big deal. They'll treat the fish if it happens. So those are kind of the different takes on it and the honest appraisal, in my opinion, of the situation. So I hope with this info, you guys can decide what's best for you and what kind of tank you want to keep. As always, take care and I'll see you guys next time on Fishery.